Good afternoon. So I, I'm going to, uh, to shift gears and speak um, a bit more granularly about, uh, about much of the work that I do, which is in the uh, molecular profiling uh, of cancer. Um, everyone knows about precision medicine, that's why we're here. Um, so in the ca cancer context, what we're mostly talking about today is, is looking at genetic changes to uh, establish diagnosis or prognosis, uh, importantly response to therapy and potentially uh, uh, side effects. Um, so in our traditional analyses, uh, we're looking at tumor, uh, our traditional analyses are tumor type and, and uh, marker specific. We're using immunohistochemistry, in situ hybridization, and, and PCR. We're looking at, at a single or a small number of markers with highly specific limited information. An example would be a, a, a HER2 testing. Here we're looking for an increase in HER2 copy number that predicts responsiveness to trastuzumab, to, um, and you can do that a few ways, fish. Um, I mean, histochemistry uh, or even expression profiling. Um, another, uh, another example would be uh, uh, this uh, uh, t single mutation test for uh, uh, EGFR mutations, where we're looking at a mutations in a single gene that relate to a single class of drugs uh, and predict uh, therapy. Uh, but what's happened is we've come to look at cancer in a new way, and now we're seeing can cancer as a series of interrelated pathways. And what we're trying to do now is look at many genes and interrogate them for mutation simultaneously to, to try to understand the biology of the tumor and to treat it in that manner. Um, and so hence we have next generation sequencing, uh, which is the tool that allows us to do this. Um, it's resulted in uh, enormous uh, decreases uh, in, uh, in uh, per base costs. Um, we can uh, interrogate large regions of DNA, targeted regions. We can look at the whole exome or genome. Um, we can do deep sequencing to, to, to detect low-level mutations. Um, and, and the detectable mutation types uh, span the gamut from, from single nucleotide changes to rearrangements and copy number uh, changes, and, as well as uh, 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 deletions and insertions. Um, so so uh, basically, uh, th this has really entered, uh, entered uh, routine care in, uh, in a big way. Uh, uh, and there's a couple ways to do this. Uh, there, there's, uh, this is, this um, is a uh, report from uh, Foundation Medicine, which is a, one of the early providers uh, in this area. They, they sequence, I believe, 315 genes and, and a bunch of introns. Um, so this is one way to do it. They use uh, a capture method uh, for, uh, for library construction. Um, and then there's, uh, I think, the more uh, common method within uh, academic medical centers and hospitals, an and Amplicon-based uh, uh, method of generating the library, uh, which really looks at uh, tumor hotspots. So, and, and typically, these, these are anywhere from, say, 20 to, to 50 genes. Um, so how are our oncologists using uh, these tools? Um, well, for diagnosis, and, and, and this tends to be somewhat more um, in the diagnostic realm, I, th I think it's um, uh, even more so perhaps the, the, uh, the pathologists, um, uh, who, where they use these as ancillary markers to help uh, identify tumor uh, versus benign or tumor subtypes. Um, importantly, we're looking at appropriate targeted therapies, um, the identification of resistance mutations, but truthfully, much of the, the broad testing, um, and, and I'll distinguish broad testing from, from simply using NGS as a methodology. I mean, we, we, at our institution, we, if I do an EGFR, I'm going to do it by NGS. That, that's what I do. Um, and, and that's just a methodologic substitution that allows us to do a bunch of mutations uh, uh, that, are, that are known um, and enhance the workflow. Uh, uh, but but um, the big use for, for broad profiling is actually off-label use in clinical trial selection. Um, and what we're finding is a lot of number, a lot of variants, um, large numbers of mutations with uh, with potential prognostic and therapeutic relevance. Um, we often don't know what, usually don't really know what to do with with, with them. Um, many genes uh, uh, overlap different cancer types. Uh, germline variants, a key, really key. key Key issue uh, that that that's that we're just beginning to address. Um, th these must be distinguished. So to translate all of this into a useful test requires the ability to first accurately and reproducibly detect 
variations, which is another a whole talk in and of itself, but then meaningfully interpret the results and effectively uh, communicate them. And, and the types of questions we ask are, are, is the mutated gene potentially relevant to the patient's management? If so, in what way? Is the particular variant potentially relevant uh, to, the, to the patient's management? If so, in what way? The variant analysis can be uh, if equally or more complex than the gene analysis at, at the ground level. And then, um, it, you know, is it the, is it the uh, type of gene that appears to respond to therapy? Is it a type of mutation that appears to res respond to therapy? Is it in a tyrosine kinase domain? And sometimes we do a lot of extrapolation. So, so how do insurers and how do, how do payers view this? Well, um, this is, our, I think, the country's largest private payer. Um, so so th this is a recent coverage decision, July 1st. Molecular profiling using multiplexer next generation sequen sequencing technology is proven medically necessary for guiding systemic chemotherapy in patients with metastatic stage 4 non-small cell lung cancer when the following criteria are met. Um, and basically, they, they say uh, testing for EGFR, uh, HER2 mutations, RET rearrangements, and uh, ALK uh, gene rearrangements. That doesn't sound like 315 genes. It doesn't sound like 50. Um, their, their comment at the bottom is molecular profiling using multiplex or NGS technology is unproven and not medically necessary for all other indications. So that, and I think that, by and large, I think that many payers perceive uh, what we're doing uh, in that way. So, so are they right? Um, I think they have an argument to be made. So we did a study at our institution. Uh, we did a, a prospective study, looked at, um, I think, 224 uh, tumors that were profiled. Uh, we found, I think, almost half of them had some sort of potentially actionable mutation. In the end, about 11 percent, uh, I think 24 out of the 223 patients received um, received some therapeutic change. Half of those were clinical trials. That was 12. Nine of those were um, off-label use, and then three of them were on-label use, uh, which, you know, anything on-label you could, you know, pretty much get with other tests. So um, to the extent that, that these are patients who have exhausted other therapeutic options, um, they, they, uh, their prognosis isn't good, uh, we're basically using um, and uh, pathophysiologic reasoning, educated, uh, informed decision making, uh, in order to try to treat people who who don't have other options, um, including putting them on clinical trials. Should should an insurer pay for that? I you know they may consider it research, but I think at a major cancer center, people come to a major cancer center to be treated that way. Um, how, how, can we, uh, how can we fill these gaps? Um, really what we need is more, uh, are more data, and I think the problem is, is that the data are lacking. Again, we have, we have the situation with patients who have extremely bad, uh, a, a extremely poor likelihood or, or a, a, of, a, of a positive outcome. They've exhausted therapeutic options. We, we really don't have anything else we can do for them. Can we, can we find a mutation that they're potentially responsive to? Do we have a targeted therapy that is active against one, a tumor type, a, a different tumor type with that, with that mutation? Can we try it in, in another tumor? Uh, and and I, you know, I, think, I think that's sort of what we're left with, or can we put them on a clinical trial, uh, which, is, which in some ways is, is you know, from a medical information standpoint, is better. Um, the new type of trial, that the new innovation in trials uh, that, that we're, we're looking at are, our, our, um, our basket trials, instead of looking at the histology of the tumor, we take tumors and we, we, we look at, um, at the mutation and we categorize them by mutation and drug. Um, so NCI has a couple of these uh, types of trials that they're funding, the, the NCI impact trial. In this trial, they're looking at, at four treatment regimens. They're looking at three pathways and 20 uh, targeted genes. Uh, there's the NCI match uh, a trial where um, they're looking at uh, potentially 3,000 patients. Um, again, a series of, of, of different tumor types looking at specific mutations and specific uh, targeted drugs. Uh, this is uh, a, a different type of study, a registry study. Uh, uh, the ASCO's uh, TAPER trial that's taking place in private practice. I'm actually on the, the we have a molecular I'm on a molecular tumor board. We, we have this, this, we actually have um, meetings with uh, community physicians who have questions or enroll, uh, with patients who are enrolled in this study and present the findings to a tumor board to decide whether or not uh, to, to take action with a specific drug. Um, so what do we need? We need, we need 
trial information, but we also need tools to, to help the, the, uh, the, the people providing these data uh, to efficiently and effectively uh, communicate the meaning of, uh, of, of the variants. Uh, this is an example of, of one such tool, Alamute. Uh, it, uh, I use it. Uh, we, um, it, it, you know, it provides links to different resources and, and, uh, and sort of helps with organization. Uh, believe it or not, Google can be a really good tool. I use it all the time. It's probably better than anything else we have out there. But that, um, and, and then this resource, My Cancer Genome, I think a lot of you are probably familiar with this from Vanderbilt, uh, that uh, uh, William Powell, uh, I think, was the uh, originator. And um, this, this provides a, a, a wonderful summary of, of the meaning of various uh, uh, mutations in, in different uh, tumor types. Um, uh, and, and then we need to learn how to report and, and, I, and, and, so, and to collate these data. So this is a company, N of One. They provide a, a, dis, a decision support product. Um, it, it helps uh, uh, list clinical trials in addition to, so, so it'll give you the mutation, help you draft a report w which provides a mutation and, and potential uh, therapeutic options and then uh, p uh, potential clinical trials. Um, this is uh, another company that does, that does something similar, and they, they break it down by region. We, we, it, it's always hard to get people on clinical trials. It's, uh, people don't necessarily want to go to, people who live in Cleveland, they don't want to um, go to, you know, can't go to a trial in Los Angeles. So, uh, so we try to um, uh, uh, use uh, uh, tools that, that, that uh, can inform the, the oncologists uh, about, local, uh, about local trials. Um, and, and, and so I, I think um, in, the, in the end, um, w what we're really dealing with is a situation where we have wonderful tools, we have to use them to learn, we don't have any other option. Uh, the reimbursement is, uh, is questionable at best for, for the bigger panels. The, the smaller panels are, are starting to be reimbursed, but, but in the solid, and I, I saw one, one series of data from one, one Medicare provider, 75 percent of, of, of the profiling on the 5 to 50 genes, the 81450 uh, uh, code was paid uh, 75 percent of the time, uh, around half or less for, for the solid tumor. Um, for the solid tumor code. So, so the, the, we're starting to get some inroads in, in, in more narrow profiling. There's some tests uh, before the FDA with smaller numbers of markers. And I think what we're really finding is, is that the, the key markers and, and the ones you can develop a solid evidence base for each tumor tend to be uh, relatively small in number. The problem is, is that there, there can be reasons to, to, to look at more markers in, in, in an individual case. Um, and, and it, it also, uh, from a laboratory perspective, it's very helpful to be able to, um, to perform a test, uh, one test for everything, unless you have enormous volumes. So, um, but I guess, I guess what I, the, the, the take homes that I, I would leave uh, from this uh, presentation is really, I mean, we have to acknowledge, I think, that there is a paucity of data, but we also have patients who are, who have exhausted therapeutic options. We have, we have, of a core group of mutations in, in, in many tumors uh, uh, that, that, are, um, that are known to be actionable. Um, and we have a series of, and, and a growing number, over 1,000 uh, targeted therapies in development um, for other mutations. Uh, can, you, can you go from one tumor to the next uh, with, with a particular drug? That's just something we're going to have to empirically learn. So I, would, I, would, I will acknowledge that, that the, the data aren't there presently to, to, uh, to, to definitively uh, decide whether or not this testing is going to help somebody, whether in bulk or, or even in, you know, many of the specific uh, genes and mutations. Uh, but on the other hand, we're not going to learn if we don't do it, and patients don't have any other options, and if we do have a realistic and reasonable chance of helping, uh, helping those patients, I, I would, uh, I would uh, urge um, a broader consideration of the uh, clinical uh, utility criteria that many payers, upon which many p payers rely uh, to make these uh, decisions. Thank you, Roger. Next, we have Julie Johnson presenting from the Ignite Network.